Welcome back to Second Breakfast and our ongoing Game of Thrones coverage. Today we're turning returning to our favorite boy, Tyrion, for Tyrion Chapter 4. I love Tyrion. I mean, hot take, but he's the greatest character. <laughs> he really is. Every chapter feels like a landmark in this book. I know we've talked about Danny's chapters feeling like checkpoints for the whole story. Right. But these are the highlights Absolutely. so far. I'm just loving these chapters. They're just the most fun. Even if they're dark and grim and terrible, I have the most fun reading his chapters. This was maybe the most fun to read. I didn't have many thoughts until I was stewing and marinating after the chapter. But yeah, this, this one, was, it was a great adventure to just was. read. It was. Yeah, like reading it was very fun. And I was with you too. Afterwards, I was like, I don't know what I really want to say about this mm-hmm. other than I loved it. This was one where it rewards you for really slowing down and, and diving in deep and, yeah. and stewing. Sometimes things just pop out on uh-huh. the page like... Any chapter of brands is going to be like boom, 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 <laughs> symbols, right? And things pop out for lots of other characters. But this one was just like you had to sit with it. But it was rewarding to we're, do so. We're on a really interesting schedule right now because every Friday we're doing these Game of Thrones episodes, which give you the full fat deep dive analysis of a book, which means you get subtext, which means you get our rolling theories and original ideas. And it's very slow because it's a very small amount of text and very small amount of plot. Yeah, it's more of a close reading. It's deep, exactly. But then on Tuesdays, of course, we're talking about House of the Dragon, which means we get the big spectacle of HBO. We get Tristan in the mix. It's We get stuck with adaptation. Yes, and dramatization Mm -hmm. and the gulf of historical ambiguities. And that's a whole different kind of discussion. And then on Sunday, is mm-hmm. on, on Patreon lately, we've been doing these bonus episodes going chapter by chapter through Fire and Blood, which is George R. R. Martin's source material for House of the Dragon. And that's a very different experience. Yeah, it's zoomed out plot. It's kind of this best of totally different kind of discussions. I think that's been some of our best analytical work ever in the 385 <laughs> episodes we've done of this show. <laughs> I'm fun. really proud of that series over on Patreon. Go check that out. But I, I always like this kind of reset on Fridays of coming back to Game of Thrones. Yeah. Because that real-time character work and action and language and description is so rich. I feel like it centers me so I can then bounce and bop and pinball around for those other episodes. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. It is fun to to engage in this exact same world, but in like three very different ways. So. Yeah, and I'm not burnt out on it yet. I'm not either. I was a little worried, but uh, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Me too. It's Me very too. challenging. Yeah, it's it, but it's cool. been fun. I, I'm enjoying it. Um, let's do a recap of this chapter, and we can dive into our close discussion. Um, a quick spoiler reminder for all the for everything for the books and the shows after this. So this is a Game of Thrones Tyrion number four. Um, so Tyrion has been captured by Catelyn and um, and her men, and some of, and his men have also been captured. This is remember back in the, in the inn. She was like, "Hey, Tyrion, seize him, arrest him." Um, so they are on the seize road. Him? Yeah, <laughs> seize him. Yeah, um, they're on the road, um, presumably to Winterfell. And Tyrion has been blindfolded, but he, like everywhere he hears, "Okay, we're heading to Winterfell." And so Tyrion is very smart, and he's been sort of like laying the breadcrumbs to get people to rescue him because he knows that Tywin will um, send people after Tyrion and that Tywin will pay anybody who rescues Tyrion like very handsomely and so he's like hey my rich dad would really hate to hear that I'm being captured (laughs) so it'd be great if somebody could rescue me from Winterfell so he's being very smart but there's just one problem. Um, they're not actually going to Winterfell. They're going to the Eyrie. And so Tyrion's plan of like getting people to head off to Winterfell is totally useless. Catelyn outsmarted Tyrion in this moment and was saying loudly, yeah, we're going to Winterfell. But meanwhile, they're actually going on the East Road to the Eyrie. She was dropping her own breadcrumbs. Exactly. So he's like, ah shoot okay <laughs> um and so this road is actually very dangerous we, we saw Catelyn sort of make this judgment in her last chapter before she met Tyrion she was like I shouldn't go that way this road is full of clansmen and shadow cats and not it's that like kind of rocky clansmen. oh oh geez no not that kind I didn't even think about that it's spelled different didn't even think about that no like 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 highland people basically hill people as they say <laughs> Um, okay, it's it's full of people who are dangerous. Of the hills. Of the hills, right. And so, <laughs> I just didn't even, whatever, it's fine. Um, and so this this journey has been difficult. It's it's a difficult road. It's mountainous. And Tyrion's like, hey, Catelyn, if I die on this journey, that's really not going to help the problem that you have. So just keep that in mind. Um, and they're, they're talking about it, about the whole Bran thing. And he's like, hey, I didn't order Bran killed. Like that, I wouldn't do that. And Catelyn is like, I don't believe you. And he's like, why would I use my own dagger? Like, that doesn't make any sense, Catelyn. And she's like, oh, 
don't know. That's she like kind of like falters for a minute. Um, but then their conversation comes to a halt because they are under attack by a group of people from the hills. <laughs> um, these these guys who basically have like no allegiance to any houses. They're kind of they're sort of like wildlings almost. Like that that's the best comparison. And Tyrion says, "You have to arm us, like me and my men who you've captured, because otherwise you will lose. Like we will all die." And Catelyn's like, Ugh, "Okay, fine." And so Tyrion is given an axe. His other men are given swords, and so then battle ensues. Um, eventually our group Tyrion and Catelyn's men they win the battle but they lose three men but the other guys lose a lot more and so they continue on and Catelyn um, allows Tyrion to keep his axe um, because she kind of just decides it's probably a good idea also in that battle Tyrion kind of saved Catelyn's life so that's totally saved her yeah most of the other guys were ridden down or otherwise occupied in combat Tyrion had his axe took out a guy on a horse yeah then killed the guy heard (laughs) Catelyn scream ran over and took down two guys to save her it's pretty pretty cool like it's it's a great bit of action really fun to read and so they're sort of continuing on the road and Tyrion says so where were we in our conversation he's like hey that wasn't my dagger like number one I wouldn't kill somebody with my dagger but number two uh, Peter's story Peter Baelish's story is that I won that dagger after betting against Jamie during attorney but he says Callan I would never bet against my family (laughs) and that's where the chapter ends so fun so just like it's got all the game of thrones it checks all the marks marks right we've got really cool interesting location we've got a uh, action-packed bloody battle we've got great wordplay we've got great character work it, it's got it all i, really I, I said it. this last week about our last ned chapter that i felt like we were finally hitting the part of game of thrones i wanted to get to to talk about mm. i think we do that again here oh, we're okay. now on a streak of these being exactly what i was hoping for when we started this journey at the end of last year mm. so Uh, Just an observation to start things off, and then I have a little theory I want to build to. Okay. I think it's a really interesting subversion that isn't hit on the head so much as it is something you notice passively after the fact. I think it's pretty interesting that the first two characters in this book, in this world, to see real combat... Catelyn and Tyrion. I was thinking about that. I was like, is this the first moment, like, except for the prologue, which is different. Like, is this our first, like, true moment of combat? Because the tourney doesn't count. I was fake. I was going to say this chapter, and I was going to say Tyrion, but I think you have to give it to Catelyn for fending off the guy trying to kill Bran. Oh, that's true. Which isn't, like, a a battle, but that was combat. It's a life or death struggle with knives. (laughs) Yeah. And she won. So, well, she had an assist from a dire wolf. But (laughs) yes, I, I love that it's Tyrion and Catelyn who are the first characters because Mm. so many of the other characters we even saw last time with Ned when Varys came to visit him and he just had his sword out like just in case or you see other characters like John and Rob and Ari and all these people training for battle yeah but that the first two battle tested characters we see on the page are Catelyn and Tyrion that got me thinking Mm. so I was trying to look at this sideways turn the book sideways turn the book upside down get a different perspective on this because The first thing I got, kind of shaking this chapter upside down to seeing what fell out of the pockets, the first thing I got was that Tyrion feels like a temporary Tolkien riff. Oh, okay. How so? This version of Tyrion that we get in this chapter, if you look back at Tolkien, we know George R. R. Martin is the Tolkien guy. Yeah. This is a very different kind of dwarf with an axe. Uh, Oh, interesting. Gimli. Who's fond of taverns and quippy (laughs) and gets friends because he's funny. (laughs) There's a moment where he makes the the other guys laugh, the guys who are holding him hostage, and he's yeah. like, ah, there's something. That's yes. a start. Yes. So is Bronn his Legolas? <laughs> I mean, that's where it gets tricky, and I don't think it's meant to be a full one-to-one fellowship thing. No, But it's right. interesting to surface that sort of Gimli echo on Tyrion here. Mm. And I think it's this continuous process that we've seen throughout these four Tyrion chapters of expanding out this character and teasing these possibilities, these potential futures. Because you could say that this whole plot line now of Catelyn and Tyrion, this like road trip of unhappy, (laughs) unfamiliar people, it is becoming a little bit of a fellowship. Obviously that won't last, but I think that's what earmarked this for me to Mm. kind of look for a Tolkien comparison. Yeah. And I think the Gimli thing fits for the moment. But obviously that's not an ongoing characterization. So if we look at this chapter as a one-off, as a new shade of Tyrion that we add to the overall portrait of the character, this version, this axe-wielding Tyrion, immediately I'm thinking about Blackwater. Mm -hmm. That's where this version of Tyrion will return. Yes. And maybe that's the culmination of this side of Tyrion. 
Because I think that's the only other time we see him in combat. Hmm. Is there some battle in the war before, like in in the show, they just like have him get knocked out and then he doesn't fight? Does he he fight? He does get conked out, yeah. Um, And I think the show does the same thing where we don't see it. Oh, okay. But the only other time I see him like riding into battle is (laughs) Blackwater. Blackwater. Mm. Because even the battles after that, he's firmly in that strategist position right right we never yeah. see him wielding an axe killing a horse again yeah i mean like it, it makes sense he's not he's not the guy you're gonna put in your front lines but it's an interesting thing to to make him a heroic warrior figure in this fourth chapter mm-hmm. it's an interesting expectation and characterization to develop early and so loudly to the point of him saving the you know momentary damsel in distress of having <laughs> catlin screaming far off sure it's interesting to have them play those kind of old school fantasy roles and then never really come back to that after Blackwater. I just kind of wanted to put a pin in that hmm. and see if we if we do see shades of this Gimli Tyrion later on. Because when I'm picturing this in my head and trying to kind of root through all of these other books <laughs> and episodes, I'm trying to th- picture this version of Tyrion, this version of Peter Dinklage in armor. And I don't think we ever see this version of Tyrion in the show. Yeah, no, we really don't. We, he's he, They really focus on his intellectual strength more than anything else. I mean, and that is still his key strength and character trait in this in the book as well. But yeah, we don't get quite as uh, robust a picture of him in the show. Because having this version of Tyrion at this point, I think even in absentia, strengthens the connection to John. Well, yes, because I was going to say, I was thinking about this is Gimli thing. If we drew that comparison... To, with uh, John as Frodo when we were introduced to Sam and we kind of had this like pseudo fellowship at the wall with John and Sam and um, Pip and oh, Gren or Glenn or whoever Gren, it was yeah. right so like the four of them being the four hobbits and if Tyrion is so close with John that then that connection continues here so that makes sense but he's Sam is not just the new Tyrion because the Tyrion we see in this chapter is more John than he is Sam Right, and then also like Gimli, and Gimli is not Samwise, so there's the, that too as well. So, but if yeah. you <laughs> sprinkle bits of kind of survival level combat throughout Tyrion's journey, not only does it strengthen the relationship and sort of the 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 ties that the reader feels between characters like John and Tyrion, but I think also later on when he's sort of butting heads with Jorah, mm. I feel like if you gave him a bit more combat, those two guys might have more of a. a kindred spirit sort of connection yeah yeah i'm trying to like stretch and flex this character to (laughs) see him because the evolution we've gotten over just four chapters of his time and this chapter is almost you could just call it a catlin chapter yeah it's it's as much her chapter as it is his totally yeah but the evolution we see from him so far i think not only makes him our favorite character but i also think you could call him the most dynamic an indispensable character so far if you're looking at characters who could be good rulers or indispensable advisors to anyone with a claim to the Iron Throne. Mm. The first chapter, I went back through my notes to kind of collect this theory. The first chapter, there's that line about the long shadow falling off of Tyrion (laughs) Lannister that compares him himself to being maybe a king in the future. Mm -hmm. Chapter two, we start immediately dropping breadcrumbs about him being the bridge between ice and fire. Yes. That's what we talked about in that discussion. That's right. He also feels like a lore master. We're, we're immediately thrown in with how well-read he is. Chapter three, we had a discussion about the old man archetype. Yes. And Tyrion being this kind of sixth sense oracle of doom. He can sense danger and plan for it, and he's whip smart. And we argued that it, it, feel, it felt like he was being elevated to the role of of a protagonist. Mm, That's right. And now in this fourth chapter, we get warrior Tyrion, (laughs) who's like not just a survivor, because at the beginning he's hiding with the the bard, but he becomes a savior at the end. He's using his knowledge of the realm. They throw a hood on him when they're transporting him to the Eyrie, but the second they take off the hood, he knows where he is and he has a plan. Mm. And at the very end of the chapter, he does ultimately sort of outsmart Catelyn. Totally. Yes. Even though he, he he's angry that she's one step ahead for <laughs> totally. most of the chapter. Mm. So he's being evolved and powered up a ton. I mean, if you had, if you had like a graph of these characters' movements, Tyrion's is a straight line up mm. through these four chapters. So the question is becoming, in my mind, is Tyrion becoming something more than just the ideal hand of the king? Hmm. I mean, 
it certainly seems like it right now. Like, so that me that makes his hand of the king, um, status almost feel like inadequate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and and so that I mean that's this might be more than anything a great argument for he should be like king not hand of the and king. I, yeah i want to keep that alive because i do not think it matters that we have seen the show and read the books and know we know that that doesn't happen right i don't think that matters at all because like i said we're doing three george R. R. martin episodes a week <laughs> which means i am mainlining this guy's brain and artistic <laughs> output and i think i'm starting to see the matrix sure i'm, I'm starting to crack a little bit mm. because I started seeing these little breadcrumbs through the chapter as almost feints or distractions, almost low-hanging fruit that I was trying to cast aside and search for something deeper. There's a reference to the Dothraki yeah. early on, and Tyrion saying he doesn't really care for Dothraki customs. Mm -hmm. And that, like, I don't know, 384 episodes ago, I would have said, well, that's an interesting allusion to the future connection he'll have with Danny's storyline. Yeah, right. But I think that's a fake out. I think that's <laughs> supposed to engage you while George does some tricky stuff in the back. Oh, okay. And now that I'm thinking about it, I think that might be the purpose of that Gimli echo. What giving do you mean? Giving the dwarf an axe mm -hmm. in, in a big sprawling fantasy thing will recall that mm -hmm. for a lot of people. I don't think that's an incredibly incisive observation, which means it might be a fake out. And I was I was rereading my notes and looking for the deeper level of this to try to see what I missed, what that deeper level of analysis might be. L look at the chapter if I frame it this way okay. and see what comparison sort of rises to the surface. Okay. This chapter begins with Tyrion finagling his way. I had to I've used that word forever, but I've never spelled it. Finagle? I had to Google it. <laughs> How I know is it the spelled? word, but F I N A G L E. Okay, well. Tyrion yeah. finagles <laughs> his way out of a tavern mishap, travels with a suspicious band of strangers. I know what you're doing. Until they're ambushed <laughs> by brutal riders in the mountains. Yeah. And then swoops in to save the day and his new companions. He is Strider in yeah. Bree and Aragorn at Weathertop. Absolutely. I see that. I completely see That's that. That's what's being planted. Th these are not breadcrumbs. These are seeds eight feet deep in the dirt. Mm, that's really interesting. I, I like that too, especially because when we were th talking through this, you know, these Tolkien echoes, I was like, well, maybe Bronn is not Legolas. Maybe Bronn is like a bastardized Aragorn, like this like sort of like loner guy who's just there. But I, I He's also- He's a misdirection. He's a red That's herring. also a, a fake Tyrion the exactly. king lingers in the distance. I really like that. And well, and this is sort of tying into the, some of the stuff I was thinking about. I, I think you're totally on it here. And I like that because what's like one of the biggest things you know about George is that he likes to, I call him George. He's my friend. We're, <laughs> we're, we're pals. Uh, it just, it's so long to say his whole name. It anyway, is. Um, and you can't just say Martin. You're like, who's Martin? Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> one of my, like the, one of the things we know about him is he takes classical fantasy tropes especially tolkienian ones and flips them changes them bastardizes them like makes them darker makes them scarier makes them harsher right and so what i was thinking about was who wins this battle and how do they win and what does that mean so let's put a pin in Tyrion as aragorn as this like destined king as this fantasy hero like aside from frodo like john can still be the frodo hero here but Tyrion can be um the mentor hero and the one who becomes king of of all the land so i was thinking about the shadow cats Let's back up here because I was like, this, there's a lot about the shadow cats in this in this chapter. They're they're worried about them when they're on the road. Tyrion says, like, thinks to himself, if I were just to, like escape, I would not get very far. The shadow cats would make a morsel of me like it wouldn't go well. And then when they fight these guys from the mountains, the hill people, um, we the, the like leader of of this group comes in. He's a big guy wearing the cl a cloak that's the skin of a shadow cat. And then at the end, um, when they win, that guy is dead. They take the shadow cat cloak. And then as they're leaving, they don't have time to bury the bodies because they're worried that they'll get tracked down by the guys who survived or somebody else will attack them. So they leave the bodies. They hear the shadow cats behind them scavenging the dead bodies. So the shadow cats are really present here. And I was like, okay, what, what's going on there? What are we doing? And I was looking into shadow cat lore, <laughs> just like on the like Westeros wiki. What? To are see they if there's a real anything? animal? Or no, is this, it okay. is a fake made okay. up. It's a made I don't up know animal. anything. It's basically sort of a, it's kind of like a black and white tiger looking animal, but it's smaller than a tiger. I think it's more meant to be like the size of like a, 
like a mountain lion. Okay. Basically. Sure. I mean, it's, it's like a big, large feline predator. And um, I think like in my head, they look kind of like a lynx, but bigger and black and white. There's an animal like this in Dune. Is that's there? interesting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's fun. And so I was thinking about this and, and I was digging into the lore. There's not a lot of lore, unfortunately, but in my digging around, I learned that this cloak that they win at the end of the battle, the, the singer who's traveling with them, the troubadour, he keeps the cloak. But I learned that later on, Tyrion ends up keeping the cloak and he keeps it for a long time, like several books. It's not mentioned very often, but it's men- mentioned beyond this book. And so Tyrion sort of wins what to me feels like the symbol of victory of this battle. So I was trying to figure out what that means. And these shadow cats, they don't tend to hunt people unless they're really hungry. They seem to be more like scavenger predators and maybe they'll attack one small person in the middle of the night but they weren't going to go after this whole group of people so like when they hear them behind them as they're walking away they're not that worried about it they know they're going to go after the dead bodies but so they they lurk around in the dark and they're scary and monstrous and then you end up like wearing one ends up being like this symbol of victory but it's not like heroic grand romantic victory it's like harsh grim victory this battle is written in a way that's very exciting and like ooh awesome like big fantasy battle but it's still like gross and dark and not ha- no one's having a good time <laughs> and Tyrion doesn't end it being like wow that was exhilarating i want to do that again uh-huh. he ends it he's like oh my god that was horrible <laughs> you know and he's like wow that was that was really intense and it felt a lot scarier than it really was and the guy seemed bigger than he actually was and they lose some of their guys and like there's like the guy that one of the guys Tyrion ends up killing like bleeds out through his mouth and it's gross and terrible and so i was thinking about maybe it's meant to be like this emblem of like this this cloak is this emblem of like harsh evil victory like this necessary evil that you have to embody in order to win because these guys that they beat are not like um you know loyal to a certain house they're 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 bad evil guys who are not loyal to anybody and they'll just kill anybody around and so they have to like take this symbol of victory that ends up um representing not heroism but just like survival and so i was thinking about that and i think and so it's like this idea that in order to win you have to embody the evil of those around you and that's what Tyrion really does like over the course of the series Tyrion is a bad person and also a good person like all of the best characters in this in this series are but the way that Tyrion wins, the way that Lannisters win, is they outsmart the people around them and they one up people at their game. And even at the end of this, it, Tyrion like thinks to himself, like Lady Stark could keep her trust so long as he could keep the axe, he would count himself ahead in the game. Because I think a more romantic version of this chapter, like a Tolkienian version, is that at the end of this, Tyrion and Catelyn are friends. Like they 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 killed the mountain troll in the bathroom together, and now they're friends. Bonded by trauma. And that's not what happens here. Like Catelyn's like, I still don't trust you, and Tyrion's like, Yeah, I don't trust you either. And they they look at each other differently, but they're not like buddies now. They're not like, let's go off together into the sunset as a fellowship now. Like it's still harsh, and like Tyrion will betray Catelyn the second it's convenient for him. Like it's not like he's gonna be pals with her forever. And so if you're thinking about Tyrion as this. George R. R. Martin version of Aragorn as Strider, as our king, as our hero. I think that works here because we know that he will walk away with this symbol of victory, but victory in like a harsh, like sad, evil way and not in a like heroic, um, glorified, romantic way. And then that cloak almost becomes a talisman Mm -hmm. or a, a monument to a reminder of the need to get your hands dirty. Yes. In the same right. way, Aragorn never shaves or showers. <laughs> True. And I find it funny that the cloak, the, the skin of the shadow cat is black and white, like which would suggest <laughs> that like yeah. a black and white morality system. But we know the whole point of this world is that it's actually very gray. Right. This is that irony of the, the white cloaks, the gold cloaks. That right. Whole thing. Right. Yeah. But like this is like taking the black. So, isn't that so, simple? So maybe what this is instead is like the cloak has both. It has black and white. And then, of course, I mean, I imagine as you wear it and carry it throughout the world, it's going to become muddied and dirty and gray. So anyway, I I just liked this idea of the shadow cat cloak 
symbol and I want to like keep track of where it goes and who's wearing it and what it means. That's interesting. I didn't know what to do with the shadow cats at all. I just looked at them as some sort of interesting kind of omen flourish, but I like the lemonade you made out of them. I think you're you're good for stuff like that. Yeah, that, and that was interesting. And I don't know if this is like something that George was really like playing a long game thinking about, but I just like it as a repeating motif and I, I want to see um, how else it, it comes up. Going. Sure. So you, your, your Tolkien comparison theory I think works really well like Tyrion gets this symbol of victory but it's it, it's not as glorified as we might think it would be interesting in, in like a Tolkienian style story yeah I really liked this chapter the yeah, reading was experience was fantastic and then I liked how kind of tricky the analysis was I mm -hmm. think there's something there but it is more buried than usual yeah I agree I cool. agree and I I also didn't remember this part of the story at all this no, is maybe I think this is the first truly the first chapter where I was like I don't remember any of this there's one shot <laughs> I remember from the show of him kind of hulking down on the, on the side or trying to hide <laughs> from these guys running past but that's okay it. That's yeah it. I think they just do it differently in the show so that's probably why I don't remember it sure um so far I think the show has pretty much like almost seen for scene and done all the chapters we've read so far yeah so. I mean I have to find the the screenshots for the infographics and it right. is fairly one-to-one -one. it's incredible the uh, level of adaptation those first few seasons got to do yeah one more thing i'm sorry i totally forgot about this this little section of thinking about the shadow cat thing this goes to your tolkien thing um during the battle um Tyrion does not kill the guy wearing the shadow cat cloak it's he's killed by sir roderick but there was a line that stuck out to me so when he's killed it says, Tyrion saw an arrow sprout from the throat of the man in the shadow skin cloak. When he, um, when he opened his mouth, only blood came out. And that reminded me of Bran's dream. Do you remember Bran's dream where he thinks about those three shadows and we're trying to figure out who the third shadow was? We duck. okay, maybe it's Peter Baelish. Maybe it's uh, Sir Ilan Payne. Maybe it's the mountain. We did a, a lot of talk about that. I'll, I'll remind you the line is that... Um, um uh, another was armored and like blah blah over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone but when he opened his visor there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood so thinking about blood like pouring out of a mouth pouring out of a face and in our last Tyrion chapter Aegon um or sorry not Aegon <laughs> dear god Aemon <laughs> Maester Aemon not Aemon <laughs> not Aemon <laughs> Maester Aemon these these Targaryen names, man. <laughs> Sorry, spoiler. He's a Targaryen. Maester Aemon says, I think Tyrion is a giant come among us. And so that's where I said, maybe Tyrion is that third shadow that's looming over the Starks in, in, in King's Landing. And so here, like this little connection of the blood pouring out of the mouth, the blood pouring out of the visor, thinking about Tyrion as a giant and Tyrion is here. Again, like Tyrion is obviously not the person who's whose blood is coming out of his mouth. He's not even the person who kills this guy, but just the presence of these two things on the page made me think about Bran's dream. And I might be looking into it too much, but I think that connection there just like ties Tyrion in with this legendary thing a little bit more. And by giving him the cloak later on and having him tied to this, uh, this blood seeping <laughs> person, I think might even you could make a case that it elevates him to that like shadow status yeah, a little bit more, especially because it's a shadow cat and it's described as a shadow. So I think there's something there. It's more of these possible futures in the same way you could see him as a king. Eventually you could of course see him as a tyrant. Yes. I like that shadowy figure to pull us back. I don't know, four years to <laughs> when we talked about fellowship. I think there was a moment early on in Lord of the Rings where there was a shadowy sort of metaphorical figure on a cliff that they saw that we were wondering if it was Gandalf or someone else. Yeah, that I'm reminded right. of that faintly. Yeah, but that, I like that sounds that like analysis. something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, it was it was just a fun connection to draw. We haven't had a little like yeah. Bran's dream flashback in a while, so I was like, oh, maybe that's maybe that's something. Because you think if Bran, when he has the whole third eyed, uh, three eyed Raven um, multiverse, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> insight to to everything and everyone, you'd think you'd almost see these possible futures bubble up to the surface. You'd see these projections of characters as part of that uh, impossible surreal level of knowledge. So him getting almost like an iPhone notification of, oh, Tyrion looks like a, he's a promising investment right now. He could be a king. 
it'd be interesting if those sort of muddled his perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think that that is really interesting. Hmm. So I, I, I'm curious about when our next brand chapter will be. You see what... It's going to be a little while. I, you think so? Or did you look ahead? Uh, I just have a calendar on the wall oh, for our okay. episodes. I know it's not for the next few weeks. <laughs> next week, we're going to Aria. Aria, yeah. But even before that, of course, we have... Bonus episodes on Patreon, where we're still rolling through uh, the Fire and Blood chapters, <laughs> and we're also taking breaks to talk about other things. We did a Breakfast Buffet episode talking about the three Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and coming up fairly soon, we have an episode talking about the three Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, which we were new to and really, really enjoyed talking about and uh, watching all three of those movies in the theater. So that's something fun to look for. Uh, on the weeks that we're not doing the Fire and Blood um, Death March. Also on Tuesdays, we're continuing with our House of the Dragon coverage with Tristan, rolling through the show, talking about adaptation, talking about the books, really enjoying um, the conversations we're having over there, being on this, you know, usually three episode a week, George Mm -hmm. R. R. Martin tumble. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much for supporting us over on Patreon, for listening to the show. I know most of you are podcast people like us, but it's also the show's also available on YouTube. Thank you for all the thoughtful comments we get over there. If you want to email us, secondbreakfastpod at gmail.com, comments on Patreon, comments on YouTube, wherever you want to reach us. Thank you for joining the conversation. Thank you for making these possible, and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye.